two. Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and WNST.net. Those of you watching out on the WNSTV video cam, a little different camera, a little different look, and uh, certainly, Luke, uh, I am wearing uh, on the video cam here, for those watching out at WNSTV and on our Facebook, uh, I bought about 15 strands of purple rope lights back in 2006. Uh, I've gotten them all out. They all still function. They, they connect together like rope lights. Um, they, they glow a little more pink than purple, but I am trying it all out. I'm trying it out on the video camera here, and I'm hoping to decorate the entire studio in a purple glow here. Um, that's what fans do, right? I mean, that's the, that's the purple flamingos out. That's the craze on the Lamar Jackson jerseys like their Cabbage Patch dolls or Billy Beer or something for a man of my uh, era. But it does make you break out the purple lights that you once took to your mother's house and said, hey, Mom, put these up. You'll look like a Ravens fan, right? No question. I mean, the enthusiasm is there, as it should be. Uh, I think it's been there for a while now. Uh, I think you go back to uh, the, the Week 7 win against Seattle. You go back to the Sunday night game against New England, the overwhelming, impressive performances against Houston and the Rams in back-to-back -back weeks, uh, yeah, beat the 49ers in what was one of the better games of the entire 2019 regular season. So I think the enthusiasm's been there, but it's at a fever pitch now where it's time to go, right? I mean, <laughs> there'll be some waiting around this week. There'll be a uh, a lot of hurry up and wait kind of feelings going into wild card weekend, knowing the Ravens don't play. But uh, the, the time's here. Uh, it's January. <laughs> I mean, it's time to win a Super Bowl, Bowl man. Yeah, I'll, I'll get I mean, Billick on to do that this week. Right, right. I mean, th this is. You no, know, I mean, you, you channel all the different cliches, and you think of Bill Parcells years ago in NFL films. This is why you lift all them weights, right? I mean, that's the, this is what teams play for. This is what fans go through uh, a lot of losing, a lot of disappointment. Not in Baltimore, just in general. Uh, the, the endeavor of being... Yeah, we're all fan. Orioles fans here. We're familiar with that. <laughs> but, but, but in general, as a sports fan, you typically experience more disappointment than triumph. I mean, Unless you're just, a Patriots fan or an yeah, Alabama that, fan. Yeah, that's just <laughs> the nature of the beast. And that's what makes these times that much more enjoyable. And that's why, really... Not just this year, but the last 20 years for the Ravens. I mean, it's very similar to what Orioles fans enjoyed from the mid-60s through the early 80s. I mean, a, a period of time where there's so much prosperity, there's multiple championships, you're always competitive. And that's where the Ravens have been over the last two decades, save for a couple years here and there. And it's also a reminder that it's not always going to be this way. There's going to be some point in time, and you hope it's 20 years or 30 years from now, but there's going to be a time where the Ravens aren't <laughs> as prosperous as they've been over the last two decades, and uh, that, that's why you enjoy these times, and, and you understand. And We'll all move to Cleveland when that happens, because yeah, it'll mean yeah. Cleveland has prosperity. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, it'll I remember when they were going to the Super Bowl, right? How many of those rooms that I've held down in Miami were, were let go by Cleveland fans sometime right around the Thanksgiving? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about that, but there, there was certainly plenty of hype. There, there's no question about that, and Freddie Kitchens doesn't even make it to, to Black Monday. He's let go. Of I won Monday. that on Twitter, by the way. Bernard Bikini, who is uh, my dear friend, Sporting News Radio producer of mine from 20 years ago. We have him on every, uh, every time we play the Browns. So if you've listened, you've heard Bernard. Uh, Bernard was out on Twitter at like 4 o'clock before the game started saying uh, he's made a, a bet with his wife. The over-under was 9 a.m. Monday morning. I said, dude, I got the under all the way. I was in the locker room after the game at, I don't know, 7.30, right? And everybody was talking about it. So I'm like, I could had under 9 p.m. on so he didn't even make it to Black Monday. He didn't even make yeah. it out of Black Sunday, you know? Right, right. And I, I had to laugh. I, I shared this with you in the press box, but I had to laugh with, with some of the reports and speculation that how the Browns fared against Cincinnati on Sunday was going, going to impact Freddie Kitchens or, or potentially Dorsey or others in the organization. And I just had to laugh. That, that says so much about that organization, if that were true. Uh, and maybe it wasn't, and maybe some of the reports or speculation out there wasn't 
uh, on the up and up. So, in other words, if they would have won, you know, thirty-eight to three on Sunday, yeah. he keeps his job. I mean, who cares? I mean, if you're basing a decision like that off of an inconsequential, I mean, we're not talking about losing in the AFC Championship game here. We're talking about a completely meaningless, inconsequential Week Seventeen game. If that truly had any bearing on that decision. That says all you need to know about that organization. Well, look, it, it, much like it helps the Yankees and the Red Sox that the Orioles are screwed up and have been for 25 years, it, it, it helps the Ravens that the Bengals are going to screw up Joe Burrow, apparently, and, and that the, the Browns once again go into turmoil. And, and look, I don't know that the Steelers are turmoil, right? Like, they went out, ran around with Duck. They didn't have a quarterback. I mean, uh, three weeks ago, Tomlin was up for coach of the year. Now he's golfing today, uh, you know, at an Oakmont or whatever. Um, uh, you know, I would say this, the division and where the Ravens have separated themselves to beat the second best team at home by two touchdowns with the second string, right? Uh, you know, it really speaks to where the team is. And to your point, by week, we sit around, we're waiting on Ryan Tannehill, or we're waiting on Josh Allen, or Deshaun Watson, whatever it's going to be. Then we're probably going to be waiting on Pat Mahomes, or on Tom Brady. But there's something about where the team is right now, and it is it is quicksand, right? Much like Joe Flacco, and that era, and Buck Showalter, and Adam Jones, and Matt Weed. Things happen, and you don't win. Go ask the Nationals. They finally won, but it was a decade of not winning, right? Uh, Peyton Manning only got it, did it did it once until he got to Denver, right? Indianapolis only won once, all those years of prosperity, that there is something about, like, closing the deal, right? And, and, and you don't want to be the 14 and 2. By the way, you speak of Pat Mahomes coming in here, K Kansas City, the city of Kansas City and the Chiefs, other than the Royals run a couple years ago, they are always the brass ring, right? Through... Len Dawson and through Joe Montana and through Steve DeBerg and through all of the things that have happened there, uh, you know, Marty Schottenheimer, go back through the last 40 years of Chiefs history. Boy, if they're the team that's here two weeks from now with that kid at quarterback and Lee Steinberg going to fly in and, you know, half the Chiefs nation's going to fly in, tickets are going to be 350 400 bucks to get in here two weeks from now, the Chiefs would be the bleeding heart fan base, right, for, hey, Lamar can do this every year, but if Lamar doesn't win two weeks from now and win a Super Bowl, he's just Michael Vick, right? Right. Well, I mean, I don't know if I go that far, but it's certainly he's, he's the guy who won the MVP and his team was the best in the regular season, and they didn't get it done. And that's not, you know, it's not singular. It's not just him as an individual with that team. But, but yeah, I think you do look at Kansas City and – uh, I mean, we saw what happened with Mahomes on that Thursday night game, a you know, dislocated kneecap, and you know, you're wondering what his status is going to be. He only missed a couple games, but I think what's been impressive about not just Mahomes but the Chiefs is they've reeled off all these wins. They've won, what, six in a row to close the regular season. They get the first round by thanks to some help from Miami and Foxborough on Sunday. Well, they look a little bit like that team but, from a year and a half ago. It was really good, right? Well, well, I mean, they were, you know, I mean, they they were the they were the Ravens last year, essentially. I mean, not not exactly. They weren't as balanced as the Ravens. Uh, they weren't clearly weren't as good defensively. But that offense was that was the the cat's meow. That was the the flavor of the month as far as just how they played. And Mahomes was the MVP last year. But I think what's impressive not just about Mahomes, but more so about Kansas City in general, is look at how he's played over the last six weeks. It's not him going out there and having to throw for 400 yards and four touchdowns every single week, which he had to do a lot last year. He's had some games. I mean, even Sunday against the Chargers, and it's not as though Kansas City was overly impressive. I mean, the Chargers have had a poor year. They were playing in Arrowhead. They won by 10 points. Mahomes had 174 yards passing. He had one touchdown. He wasn't bad by any means, but he wasn't MVP-like. And there have been some games like that where he hasn't had to throw for 400 yards and they haven't had to win shootouts. Their defense is quietly playing a lot better. Now, it's not on a Ravens or Patriots kind of level of great, but their defense has been... Since the early portion of the season, it's been more of a top 12 kind of defense in terms of efficiency and scoring defense. So their defense has gotten better. And on Sunday, again, it's the Chargers. I'm not trying to draw 
great com- conclusions based off of that, but they ran the ball really effectively. So that's a team that's looking more balanced. It's looking uh, a little more dangerous in terms of doing different things other than just telling Pat Mahomes, we need you to throw for five touchdowns and 450 yards, which he did a lot of last year, and he's still capable of doing that. He's had some big games, don't get me wrong, but that's, that's a team that just looks uh, a lot more balanced. They're well-rounded. And if you're looking for narratives, I mean, they were the team. I mean, think about it. They had a home field last year. I mean, they looked like they were going to be uh, the team that could unseat the Patriots, and they didn't do it. They came really close. It went into overtime, uh, if you recall, and they came up short. Now, this year, they went through a little more adversity, certainly with losing their quarterback for a couple games. And uh, you can look at some other things that happened with them. Remember, they were really banged up when they played the Ravens back in September. So it's not as though it's been a perfect year for Kansas City, but even though this team's not quite as dominant as their overall body of work was last year, this is, this is the year where, you know, if you're looking for that narrative of a team that gets a little bit of redemption for what happened the year before, you know, kind of the 2012 Ravens after 2011, what happened uh, in Foxborough, you know, Kansas City could be that team in that regard. But I'm talking in, in terms of narratives and storylines. You still have to go out and play the game. So uh, I think Kansas City is certainly dangerous. Uh, there's no question about that. But uh, I, I still like the Ravens' chances going up against the Chiefs playing here in Baltimore. Here's Luke Jones. Here's Baltimore, Luke. The uh, Ravens will be uh, sort of downsizing this week a little bit, I guess, Luke. And uh, by weekish, but not. I mean, Harbaugh's going to have them around, but doesn't want them running off to Vegas. I don't know that this group's really sort of wired that way. I mean, I'm going to have Coach Billick on later this week. We have a lot of Ravens on this week talking about you know, act like men. We manage you like men. Don't do anything stupid. Um, this seems to be, and, and you know, you're around it as much. I mean, I'm around town. I get out. This, this isn't C.J. Mosley Instagramming at 3 a.m. hammered in the snow, right, by, by accident or whatever, right? Like, there's nothing sort of come out of the lid of this thing over the last 10 weeks, 15 weeks of any kind. I don't even see these guys, other than Lamar getting mobbed at a mall in Virginia, I don't see these guys out doing much of anything other than going straight back and forth to work. There, there really is a level of sort of in it and focus here that I don't remember about any other team in regard to I think these guys sleep at the castle. I really do. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think there's sometimes some recency bias there. And I mean, the C.J. Mosley thing, that, that was in the off season. When, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm half kidding. Right, I mean, and I don't want to pick on C.J. Mosley. I don't I want to pick on anybody. Jimmy right. Smith had an incident at the Green Turtle 10 years ago that we right. didn't talk about. It. But I mean, but that where there's a headline of any kind. I mean, a year and a half ago, they had a running back asleep with a, 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 smoking weed stuck in a ditch somewhere a, a mile from the facility. I mean, they've had crazy stuff go on around there. Ray Rice, need I remind you, yeah. I'm just saying the, the time off part of this, they have a bunch of grown-ups around there from what I can tell that I haven't heard anybody say anything about anything other than football and winning the Super Bowl, and that's really led by Lamar and John and Marshall Yonda and a whole bunch of other guys that have been down this road, right? Sure, and I mean, the one thing I'd say in reply to that is all it takes is one thing, and then all of a sudden uh, th- that narrative changes, but I don't expect that. I don't say expect Chris McAllister I, I to get they, pulled over at 4 a.m. in the middle of Tyson's Corner. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, I, but, but I, think, I, I think that's been the case for the most part in recent years. I mean, that's why I, I'm really hesitant as far as the whole, oh, this team's so close. I think you'd go back last year and you'd find the same exact thing. I think you'd go back two years before that, you find the same exact thing. I, I think a lot of this is just John Harbaugh has created a damn good culture, and even some of the recent years where they weren't as good, those teams still got along really well, and, and there was good locker rooms. And but if I go around there to 53 guys, and we'll do this, by the way, when we're in Miami in three weeks, right, because there will be the table set up for an hour and a half, and there will be the goofiness of media night. If they do, they'll have all of these questions because no one really knows – much about most of these guys. It's Lamar and who are the rest of these guys. And they all have a story, but the whole big trust thing, right? Like, we can laugh at that, and it's a hashtag, and, it, you, know, whatever, you know, all of that. But there is that part of the trust part of this that they talk about that's sort of built into big trust. Kind of like do your job, right? 
Yeah, but th- this is this is all because they they win. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I, again, I I think this is they have great chemistry. Don't get me wrong, and I'm not being dismissive of that. But I think so much of that is a result of winning. <laughs> I mean, I just I really do. I, I think you can if you really went back and searched, you'd find plenty of close Ravens teams in recent in recent years. They talked about it, but it. it kind of takes on a life of its own when you are winning because everyone is feeling that much better. And when you're losing, there is more, not necessarily finger-pointing, but what's the problem? You know, where's the issue? Uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily Where's Bernard mean it Pollard personal. when you need him? Yeah, it doesn't mean it gets personal, but there are more questions than it's, okay, if you're the defense, what's going on with the offense? Or if you're the offense and the defense is getting gouged. You know, I mean, uh, let's say the Ravens' defense didn't... Uh, remedy itself uh, after the first month of the season and they were this was a, a team that was much more built like say Kansas City last year that just had to outscore people and look the Ravens scored over 500 points this year they would have been fully capable of doing that would have been much more uh, closer game imagine if Lamar played the fourth quarter some of the time right right but but my point is if you had that kind of a formula compared to what we've seen since early October then you might have a little more of the not division but a little more of the, hey, let's pick it up on the other side of the ball. And, I mean, the Ravens, my goodness, I mean, for the better part of two decades, it was defensive players having to say the right things about the offense. I mean, that's just just the truth. But when you have a team that is just firing on all cylinders, it's really easy to love each other. <laughs> let's just, just leave it at that. And that's not to say that these guys don't have good character and they don't love have, get along and they don't have fun together, but... So much of this uh, is just a case of when you win a lot, that breeds really good chemistry. I, I, I think chemistry can impact your success, but I think the success much more, uh, uh, that's the creator of the chemistry. I mean, that's just, just how I feel, and other people can disagree, and that's fine. But you do have a team that's having a lot of fun, and they're having a lot of fun because they win. And you do have guys who seem to really be professional and have, have taking care of business, and to your point, there haven't been any off-field things, although, you know, like I said, that's uh, all it takes is one guy making one bad choice on the wrong night. Uh, I mean, and then that narrative changes, but it's very little evidence of dissension. I mean, there have been a couple guys, I mean, even last Friday, for example, Patrick Owasso left the practice field, got in a little bit of an exchange with John Harbaugh. I don't think it was anything over the top to, to be concerned about. And Owasso played on Sunday, and you know it was forgotten about. But you know, they have some stuff like that from time to time. I mean, you're not going to have that many personalities, coaches and players, uh, in a room, you know, whether it's a meeting room, practice field, locker room, what have you, and not have you know, some bickering from time to time or a disagreement from time to time. But it's how you handle that. And I think that's where I, I, I continue to go back to the culture, the environment, created by John Harbaugh, and that's where John Harbaugh in year 12 is so much better than John Harbaugh in year 3, 4, or 5. And that's not to say he wasn't a great coach then, but I I think even if he himself wouldn't admit it publicly, he's evolved as a coach, and and he's grown as a coach. And uh, I think he would admit that publicly, by the way. I think I'll get him to admit that publicly. It would probably be in, in how it would be framed because it not you, know, you don't want to you know uh, a lot of times you ask people that they kind of go on the defensive but you know, I think Michael Pierce said it uh, on the Christmas Eve he was asked about John Harbaugh and said that when he first arrived in 2016 they didn't play music before games uh, in the locker room and it was quiet and it was much more of a tense kind of singular focus kind of mindset to get ready for the game and. Now, a few years later, they're allowed to play music before games. And, you know, I mean, that, that could be something that could be viewed in a very negative light if you're not a very good team or if you're struggling. But there's a situation where John Harbaugh has said, hey, uh, if you guys are going to be ready uh, and good to go and focused and uh, you're, you're prepared for the task at hand, then why wouldn't I let you listen to some music before the game uh, if you feel that's going to help you get ready? So. You know, that's where you see a coach grow. I mean, Help Justin Tucker. He was the only one that heard the music in his head. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, so, so you have some of that, and you evolve as a coach. We've talked a lot about the analytics and going forward on fourth downs and being more aggressive and how that's given 
the Ravens and a handful of other teams, not many, but the coaches who subscribe to that kind of thinking and that math and win probability, they have an edge right now. I mean, they absolutely do. <laughs> I mean, you see it all the time at the NFL level and the collegiate level where you have coaches that just make decisions that make you scratch your head, and you wonder what they're trying to get out of it. Are you trying to save face or, or, or lose more respectably, or are you trying to give yourself the best chance to win? And uh, so you've just, you have a head coach who has adjusted and evolved himself, and that trickles down through the entire football team. And I think that's a big reason why you have this team that is just thriving, why you have a team that gets along so well and everyone's talking about the chemistry and big trust and how much they love each other. I mean, that, that all starts at the top. Uh, that you know, starts at the very top with ownership, uh, but with the front office and Eric DaCosta and you know, the day-to-day with John Harbaugh and his coaching staff. I mean, uh, th- this isn't the kind of thing that just comes together overnight. There's a lot of work that goes on that we don't even know about uh, that, that allows you to be in this position. And then the players have the professionalism, the maturity, the talent, Oh, let's not forget about that. This is a very, very talented football team. Uh, but all of that comes together, and you have something that is 14-2 and two and the number one seed and the best team in football going into January. Anything you want to say, Luke, about Tom Brady? Because we talked about Mahomes and, and who comes here and under what circumstances. And obviously, if it is Tom Brady that's here three weeks from now, I guess, at this point, uh, it would mean that they went on the road and won in Kansas City, right? Like, that's, that, that's what that now means. And this is a team that, I mean, hideous Week 17 loss. I mean, talk about a team that's, you know, looking like fading, like we probably won't see the Patriots in a couple of weeks. We knew all along it would be one or the other. We wouldn't have to see Mahomes and Brady, right? Right. That is the, well, as, as long as you earn Most the buy and you keep right. winning, right? That, that was the gift. The gift in this was you get one or the other. You know, I, I tend to think we're not going to see Tom Brady right now, right? Yeah, and I, I think what was so jarring to me is how poor their defense was on Sunday. I mean, we, let's face it. Uh, I mean, Tom Brady's you know, greatest of all time, won all these Super Bowls. You know, he's Go. been an MVP. He's been so great for so long. I mean, he's 42 years old. I mean, check every box. I mean, this, this guy has been remarkable what he's done longer than any other quarterback we've seen play on a year-in and year-out basis. I mean, what he's done has just been remarkable in that way. But the second half of the season, he's been a very middling, dare I say, below-average starting quarterback. I mean, the numbers bear that out. He's been very mediocre since November. I mean, or really since late October. I mean, that's just, just the truth. So, and now the defense isn't any good all of a sudden. And well, uh, I, I still think the defense is really good, but how does that happen in a game that meant so much? And look, the Dolphins have been a really nice story in the sense, uh, you know, you want to talk, you know, we've talked about John Harbaugh being a head coach, you know, coach of the year. Not, not saying I, I'd vote for the, the guy in Miami, but, you know, you, you look at what uh, he's been able to do, and considering the circumstances of how god-awful that football team was at the beginning of the year. I mean, we saw it firsthand. How, I mean, the Ravens were really impressive. Don't get me wrong. The Ravens were fantastic, and, and maybe it was a case of you know, everyone uh, you know, uh, didn't give them enough credit. But Miami was god-awful through the first half of the season. And you consider what Brian Flores did with that Dolphins team. That's really impressive. But that said, they went into Foxborough and – They scored 27 points on a Patriots defense that statistically has been up there with some of the best regular season defenses of all time. And I think it's just, it's jarring from the standpoint of New England, and I don't want to say jarring from a Ravens fan perspective because you love seeing it, but just from an objective perspective, it's really jarring to see them play as well as they did against Buffalo with their defense making plays and Brady looking a little more Brady-like uh, in that Bills game where you're thinking, okay, this, maybe this is the Patriots doing their rising from the dead. Yeah, he'll cut your thing. eye out, right? Like, literally, and he still might. Before yeah, it's yeah, and they still might, but for a game where they had a chance to, all they had to do was beat the Dolphins at home. And, and, and get a week off. They get a week off, and, and they get a chance to, Bill Belichick and the defensive coaching staff gets a chance to really look at that Ravens offense and try to figure that out, and 
Uh, they get a chance to prepare for Patrick Mahomes. And, you know, you get that, that extra week is so valuable, not just for preparing for the next game, but kind of laying out everything you want to accomplish in the postseason. You can, you can do some of that advanced work on all of your potential opponents. So they had that chance to do that, and they lost to the Dolphins. And again, Brian Flores has done a great job uh, in Miami, and I, I'm not buying the, him being coach of the year, but he's done a heck of a job because that was a historically terrible team over the first half of the season. I mean, the numbers uh, w- would bear that out, but to still lose in, in that way and then Brady to go back to looking how he was looking week, I don't know, week 11 through week 15, week 10 through week 15, it just it really makes you wonder if this is it for them. And look, I, I said this not long ago, and I'll say it again: the Patriots aren't dead until they're dead. I mean, uh, I, I think anyone who completely writes them off is, is probably not giving them. Well, I, you know, uh, there's a part where you'd love to be the one to squish them, but if you're the one squishing them, it means they beat Mahomes. Right yeah. now, we got to see exactly. one or the other. I mean, you don't like the prospects of Tennessee next week if that, if that is who it is. Oh. You think that that's that. that I, I, that's I wouldn't the team say we haven't I don't seen, like the right? prospects. I just think of those three teams, I'm, just, I'm not a big believer in Houston at this point. I, and I love Deshaun Watson, but that team has just been they, – they've had so many performances this year where not just that they lost, but they look terrible. Well, I follow time. John McClain, so it's comedy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, John McClain doesn't hold back. That's one this of the more the entertaining – the worst performance the, I've ever seen. One of the more entertaining <laughs> follows on Twitter is John McClain during a Texans game in which they're playing poorly. Because this he does is not terrible. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He starts breaking, bringing some old Oilers references, and uh, it's fun. But, but uh, Houston, I, I, I just the, – the way that they came into Baltimore coming off their bye week, and they just – I mean, they stunk. They stunk in that game. Uh, Buffalo – I, I think their defense, and we saw this firsthand when, when the Ravens went up there a few weeks ago, their defense can get some stops against the Ravens. Not going to stop them, but they can get a few stops here and there. I don't believe in Josh Allen enough that he's going to go on the road and, and be able to play well enough against this defense. Tennessee's the team that I'm not scared of them by any stretch of the imagination, but I think they do have enough firepower on offense, and, and I think their defense, which isn't great, but it's not bad. They're, they're the team that I feel you know, they, they have enough variance, they have enough big play potential that if the Ravens you know, really come out flat, you know, they, they might be able to give them a little bit of a, a closer game. At the same time, though, that Titans defense hasn't seen Lamar Jackson. You know, I mean, the Ravens played the Titans last year. It was Joe Flacco. So I'm not really worried about any of those three teams they play in the divisional round other than the Ravens beating themselves. And not coming out prepared and taking their opponent too lightly and turning the ball over. I mean, things that, they, quite frankly, they just haven't done this year. Uh, since week four, I suppose. So uh, I think from that standpoint, there's not anything to lose sleep over whatsoever with the divisional round. But you, know, you do look at the possibility of Kansas City. You know, we've talked about them. I think that's a more balanced Chiefs team than we saw last year, even if, if the offense isn't as devastating I think it's still Patrick Mahomes, and I think the fact that they've won games without him having to be Superman, he can still be Superman. So, I mean, that's just that's where you kind of just take some pause. But I don't know. I mean, New England, they look, they look the part of a team that was figuring it out against Buffalo, and for them to do what they did in a game that had a lot of meaning for them on Sunday, that's just very unpatriots-like. And for them to be playing in the wild card round, it's – if we're talking a week from now and Tennessee goes in there and beats them, I'm not going to be surprised anymore. And I would have been surprised at that kind of a notion two weeks ago. Uh, I just uh, I was really unimpressed with that, and it just it makes you wonder if if this is the end for uh, what's been a, a remarkable dynasty. But that said, we also know this is a week to week league, and. We've seen some weird things, some weird losses this year. Uh, you know, some strange things have happened, and then the orders restored the following week. So we'll see how it plays out. But uh, it's tough to look at the Patriots right now. I mean, the one thing you could hang your hat on was their defense is really, really, really good, and for them to be as mediocre. And 
How about Stephon Gilmore, who has been talked about as a defensive player of the year candidate, if not the favorite, according to some people at least, uh, for him to have the rough game that he had uh, in Week 17. Uh, really makes you wonder about that team. And you know, they're not going to have a bye week now to figure it out and get some rest. So certainly puts the Patriots at a disadvantage. But, uh, again, I don't think anyone here in Baltimore or anyone outside of New England uh, is going to be shedding any tears whatsoever for that scenario for that team. I'll be drinking spiked eggnog on New Year's Eve, awaiting bye week with purple lights on my head and a purple lampshade. Uh, as uh, you know, we could have had Jason Garrett around here. I mean, never forget that, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, it is another reminder of sometimes, not sometimes, good fortune's a part of this. It is. Uh, you, know, uh, you have to be prepared. You have to have the culture. You have to have the environment to take advantage of that. That's why I said everything that's happened, I mean, the Ravens didn't know Lamar Jackson was going to be an MVP in his second year. No one knew that. Even his biggest supporters wouldn't have thought that this quickly for him anyway. But everything they had in place, the culture, uh, the environment, the, the resources, all of that was in place. And then, yeah, you do get a little lucky that you get the, the, the guy that ends up being the MVP at, at age 22. Younger than Joe Burrow, <laughs> the Heisman Trophy winner, uh, the LSU quarterback. He'll fix uh, Cincinnati. Well, hey, he he could be something, but are the Bengals gonna? Are they gonna get it right? I, I I'm I was I've been very impressed with him. I'm not a huge college football guy, but watched him enough this year. And I don't know, man. He threw seven touchdowns in the first half. I mean, how do you do that? That's pretty wild. But it's I'm still Bengals. a bigger fan of Spicoli at this point on the other team. So, <laughs> uh, but it's the Bengals and. That's where you wonder, will, will they get it right? Well, first of all, will they draft them, which they should? And two, will they have the, the, the infrastructure in place for him to succeed? And that's where you wonder. But, uh, again, the, the Ravens, they have all of that. And they have the quarterback, the MVP. Uh, they have a guy, a head coach who's won a Super Bowl. He, he's been in this position before. I mean, this is keep in mind, this is a younger team. This is a, a team that there aren't a ton of guys who – have a lot of playoff experience beyond what happened against the Chargers last year, but they have just enough experience, and they certainly have the culture and, and the talent for, for this to be a really special next uh, five weeks or so. All right, new webcam around here this week. It is uh, 2020. I am Nestor. He is Luke. You can find him out of anywhere the Ravens are going to be this week. We're also putting together a show at Adams Jeep next week. We are also putting together trips to Miami. Uh, if you want to be on the interest list, the waiting list, throw us an email, nasty at WNST.net. We will take care of that. Shout out to Sydney out at the Charles Newson off at Sons. I haven't shouted him out in a week or two. Uh, we've been uh, in and out of programming around here. We're getting our Baltimore. Positive mojo going again this week. TJ Smith this week, Martin O'Malley next week. Make sure you're checking out everything we're doing out at Baltimore Positive, including Speaker of the House Adrian Jones. You'll hear that at WNST as well. And Wes Moore to start 2020 uh, in our, uh, our second season. I feel like I'm doing a TV show with Don. Baltimore Positive. Email me anytime, nasty at WNST.net. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Instagram. I'll be in Miami next week, making sure we have hotels, making sure we have party spots, just in case the Ravens uh, make me work my purple lights. I got purple light magic in the studio and my chicken palooza shirt. We are WNST.net, AM 1570 and WNST Towson, Baltimore. And we never stop talking. Purple flamingos on the lawn and Lamar Jackson.